Good morning, merry meet, hail, and welcome to the Auckland Unitarian Church, where Sunday services have run for the last 116 years. We especially welcome our visitors and new faces, as today we reflect on Anzac Day, a national day of remembrance that broadly commemorates all Australians and New Zealanders who served and died in all wars, conflicts, and peacekeeping operations and the contribution and suffering of all those who have served. This service doesn't end until you've enjoyed a cup of tea and a chat in the second hour. We hope you'll join us for a cuppa, and we look forward to getting to know you better. This week, you might hear the German melody, the blue-eyed waltz, which was ironically used as the melody for the Maori Waiata, Pare written in 1918 for the Hawke's Bay Maori entertainers to perform as a lament for Maori soldiers killed during World War I. The Maori who died fighting for the British, the same British who were the enemy only decades earlier during the Maori land wars. Initially, Maori were not wanted to fight, but conscription was extended to them in 1917. 27 conscientious objectors amongst them were imprisoned in Mount Eden Prison, sleeping on bare boards with only two blankets, covered with lice and only fed bread. This is not a story you'll usually hear on Anzac Day. The fact that 18,000 New Zealanders died during World War I is just a number. It has no meaning until you hear the stories of those individual lives things our families never spoke of. For example, my grandmother's brother died when his merchant navy ship was sunk in World War II. It was only a few years ago reading her memoir where she wrote it was her favourite brother that died. That one word, favourite, adds so much emotion to the tragedy, making the war personal. Sharing tales like these we can better understand how our lives today have been shaped by war. Simple things such as understanding why I'm the only person of my generation with a Germanic name, Kurt. That is why I'm happy to be joined at the pulpit today by members Craig, Dawn, Max and Viv, who have their own views to share. On this week of reflection and remembrance, may we find the inspiration to reach the goal of world community with peace, liberty and justice for all. On the 28th of February 1961, the small Catholic hospital in Zambia, where my uncle was due to be born, was going to close due to violent uprisings and sabotage. My uncle was due to be born on the 27th. My grandmother drove up and down potholed roads to make sure that he came early. The hospital packed up and a white doctor accompanied the nurses up country where they were all raped and killed. Life involved sleeping with guns under the pillow and doing housework with a revolver in your apron pocket. My grandfather, in charge of council transport, sacked a black African for gross incompetence. The mayor called him and said he could not sack any white per- that he could sack any white person he liked, but not a black person. It was time to leave. The house was sold at a great loss, and the miners' strike on the day of the furniture auction meant that everything sold for peanuts. Following this, the passage booked from Durban to New Zealand had been cancelled. The ship had been commandeered for troops by the Canadians. A hundred pounds was all you were allowed to take out of the country, so all the extra cash was stuffed into the carry-cot mattress, a crying baby and a dirty napkin on top, ready for customs clearance through Zimbabwe and into South Africa. It was a really stinky napkin. 
A phone call at 10 a.m. advised a place on a ship departing at two o'clock. All the wet laundry and buckets, a baby, my eight-year-old father, and the parents made it to the ship. And although very seasick, they made it to the shock of a cold, wet Wellington winter without any warm clothes. A decade or so later, authorities knocked at the door asking, who are you, illegal aliens? Luckily, they easily got citizenship. I often think about all those families today fleeing war and upheaval. Would it be that hard to give them even a little piece of our freedom here? I'd like to invite Craig Wedge up. Like most New Zealanders of my generation, I grew up learning about Anzac Day, the significance of it in New Zealand's history, and the importance of remembering those who had died in battle. For a long time, I didn't question this, and in many ways, I still don't. The tyranny that was Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan was plain for the whole world to see. Its agenda was terrifying. So clearly World War II was a war that had to be fought and it had to be won. Sometime, however, in the last 10, maybe 12 years, I started to become, and please pardon the pun, rather battle-weary of repeatedly seeing the same TV programs, the same archive footage, the same newspaper stories, nearly all focused on the fighting and the subsequent loss of life. For a time, I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was that was making me uneasy about all of this. It took me quite a long time to finally realise what it was all about. It actually just dawned on me one day. It is peace that actually I want to remember and celebrate on Anzac Day, not war and sacrifice. And when I say peace, I don't just mean the absence of war but rather a total way of being that simply does not allow for the possibility of war between anybody. As I began to embrace the sense of peace, I began to feel compassion for all the victims of war, including our so-called enemies, especially from Germany and Japan. As I see it, they too were victims of a tyrannical regime, either manipulated or forced to act in ways that would never have imagined in peacetime. This ability to be manipulated and coerced was reinforced for me by something that, of all people, Hermann Goering said, the deputy Nazi leader at the Nuremberg trials, something which I find very profound and at the same time highly disturbing. He said, why, of course, why, of course, the people don't want war. Why would some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best he can hope for is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor in America, nor, for that matter, in Germany. That is understood. But it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of its leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in every country. Now, I read this at a time during the last US presidential election when Donald Trump was whipping up anti-Muslim and anti-Mexican propaganda in order to get more votes. And I thought, oh my God, Goering was right. It works in a democracy as well. So how do we get to a peaceful state? 
so that we cannot be easily manipulated or coerced. All the spiritual teachers seem to say the same thing, that peace always begins with oneself and within oneself. Now I'm guessing that's probably an entire sermon on its own, which honestly I don't have time for this morning. So I'll conclude by fin uh, finishing on a quote by a North American warrior, a Native American warrior, who was encountered by the acclaimed tracker and author, Tom Brown Jr., when he did his first vision quest in the 1970s. The warrior goes on to say, A true warrior is always the last to pick up the lance or go to battle. His battles are fought with the lance of love and understanding. His enemies are prejudice, greed, and bad medicine. And the biggest battles are always the ones fought within himself. So do not go out upon the earth to battle demons in the physical world, for your hatred will be like theirs. Instead, go out as a true warrior, a peaceful warrior, with love and understanding. I'd like to invite up Dawn. Anzac Day. Are we glorifying war or celebrating peace and freedom? Anzac Day. I think of my father, who enlisted in 1915, a keen athlete, a gymnastics champion, a skilled cabinet maker. He returned an amputee, gassed, and hands tight with skin grafts. I think too of Uncle Alan, an engineer conscripted in 1941 to dig out tunnels under enemy lines. Back home, he wanted only space and silence. In the 1950s, a friend, an engineer, volunteered for Vietnam. On return, he joined Doc as a park ranger. War wastes lives in death and brutally realigns the lives of others, of those who return and of those who stay at home. We're not glorifying war in remembering them. In the 1940s, Home life for me was dominated by war, listening to war news, and father marking the progress of allies in Europe and the Pacific in little flags on a big world map on the kitchen wall. And mother teaching us to knit long scarves, sew huffs, and stitch calico wrapping around the parcels for the soldiers. <coughs> And she taught us to be grateful for the food and the clothes that we could buy with our ration cards. And to be careful in pulling the blackout curtains. And to be happily helpful every Sunday when on return from church, several cousins in uniform would come for roast dinner, followed by a sing-song round the piano. And we'd always end with, Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. There was no mention of the horrors of war. The horrors the old men had faced the horrors the younger men were about to experience. There was with the younger generation an enthusiasm to seek and celebrate peace and freedom. 
Our family attended the dawn service and the Anzac parade, <coughs> though father couldn't march. The only thing he ever said about the war to me was the stretcher bearers are the only heroes of war. In the 1970s, my children, then in their teens, would not come to the services with me. They, called, they condemned what they called the Anzac glorification of war. That was the general attitude then, and attendances at the dawn service plummeted. Recently, great crowds attend the service. The grandchildren and great-grandchildren recognising that the day is not glorifying war, but honouring those who, in raw patriotism, sought peace and freedom. I remember Father's funeral, a grey August morning in Christchurch. A long RSA guard of honour, the haunting... <coughs> the haunting notes of the bugler's last post and a strong male voice calling out, They shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old. Age will not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. What? With thoughts and prayers, we will remember them. Remembering is not enough. A hundred years of thoughts and prayers have not ended war. Two decades back, I really believed we could achieve global democracy. All citizens throughout the world respecting the worth and dignity of each and every one. But nationalism is strident again. Wars rage. Thousands of refugees are again victims of war. National greed for power and resources dominate. Why do we manufacture weapons? Our defence budget is $456 per capita. Minimal compared to that of other countries. But what if that was added to the defence of citizens' rights budget for health, education and housing? We cannot celebrate peace and freedom yet. Nor do we glorify war in remembering past wars on Anzac Day. But remember, remembering's not enough. Can we build a society that refuses to go to war? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you to count off by threes and remember the number that you've got. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? And remember your number, one, two, three, and go all the way back, okay? Okay, national holidays inform us about the history and culture of their respective countries. Bastille Day celebrates the start of the overthrow of the French monarchy. The 4th of July celebrates the American Colonist Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. Our three most sacred holidays are Christmas, Easter, and Anzac Day. Now, the first two tell us that Aotearoa was conquered by Christians. We have no Maori national holidays. The Maori are invisible. Our third holy day, Anzac Day, tells a unique story. I know of no other countries besides New Zealand and Australia whose most secular national holiday is about defeat, 
not victory. Every year, Anzac Day reminds us of a military disaster, the senseless slaughter of our sons because of the stupidity and arrogance of the British imperialist class, as Craig was referring to Goering's statement. Most countries have natural enemies whom they fought for thousands of years. New Zealand, Australia, Iceland, and maybe a few others do not have natural enemies. We don't have an artificial line on our landscape called an international boundary. We have not been taught to hate the people on the other side of that barbed wire fence. On the other hand, use your imagination. Imagine if today all of Northland is a Turkish colony. It's not part of New Zealand, it's southern Turkey or whatever whatever name the Turks give it. If that were the case, all New Zealanders would be taught to hate Turks. We wouldn't celebrate Anzac Day because Gallipoli would be just one of many battles we fought to protect ourselves from them, the Muslim Turkish barbarians up north. Because we don't have a a land boundary to share with anyone, we don't have anyone we have to destroy to fulfill our national destiny. Instead, Anzac Day warns us to be wary of empires who seduce us into their conflicts and use our children as cannon fodder. Both of my mother's parents were Swiss, but she grew up in Germany where her family owned a paper factory. On the morning of November 9th, 1938, this is just before the war, but Hitler is on the rise. Hitler is a dictator at this point. She walked to school amidst the broken windows and the shattered glass and the smashed storefronts of Jewish businesses in her town. They'd been destroyed the night before in a a Nazi anti-Semitic frenzy known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. And as she walked through the rubble, a voice inside her said, this is not my country. She was only 18 years old, but she left Germany to live with her grandparents and her relations in Switzerland. Now, in Switzerland, she did not see the terror of war all around her, But she was constantly in contact with people back home. She was repeatedly told about the people who had disappeared at the hands of the Gestapo and never returned, those who had returned from the front badly disfigured, and her family and friends who had been killed or were missing. Her hometown in Germany was carpet bombed. It's an ancient town, 25,000 people, no military significance. In 15 minutes, everything she grew up with became rubble. The war killed her father, Max, and her brother, Kurt. Another family, my wife's family. Bill Nash, Guy Nash's father, whom I never knew, volunteered for the RAF at the age of 33, which was quite old. He was a combat navigator and a bombardier flying deadly missions until the last month of the war. At that time, the Allied Air Forces concluded there was nothing left of Germany to be worth bombing, so they stopped bombing. Or as the Roman historian Tacitus put it, they made a wasteland and called it peace. We here today are about the size of Bill Nash's RAF squadron. There were 48 men, 24 planes, two men to a plane. Uh, So we're just going to, for a few minutes, imagine that we are his squadron. Um, I shouldn't necessarily call them men because many of them were kids. Maybe it was two kids per plane. Uh, Most of you are only 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Bill is the old man of the group at 34. Few of you can even, are even old enough to drive a car. Bill and his squadron took off one day on yet another mission. They went out across the, the North Sea. 
They were ambushed by a swarm of Nazi fighter planes. Now, all of you who are number threes, will you please raise your hands? Okay, have a look around. The rest of you are dead. You were shot down, you were burned, or you drowned in the North Sea, and you're now rotting at the bottom of the sea. Two-thirds of Bill's squadron had been killed in 15, 20 minutes. In fighter command, every mission was a gamble with death, and the odds always favored the Grim Reaper. Now, Bill Nash's body was not damaged in the war, but his mind was. It was called war neurosis. Nightmares and bouts of insanity haunted him for his remaining 40 years. He was an emotional train wreck in and out of mental hospitals. In 1986, Bill died in bed in Auckland of natural causes. A book was lying open on his chest. It was Noel Coward's Destination Unknown. Seventeen years after Bill Nash's death, my mother died at her home in Whangaparoa. My mother and Bill Nash died 17 years apart, but they died on the same day, Anzac Day. They didn't want us to forget. My dad, Trevor, told me that he was not keen to go to war because he'd heard the horrible stories from his uncle and other soldiers who'd returned from World War I. He wasn't a conscientious objector, but he did think that wars didn't achieve anything except bloodshed and misery, and he wanted no part of one. He was already 27 years old in 1939 and maybe a little bit more mature and wiser and not so gung-ho as the usual 18-year-old cadden fodder. Actually, I heard something recently on the radio that really explained to me that after the Depression, or the Depression was still going, really, in the late 30s, and a lot of young men had no money, no jobs, and that meant they weren't able to start a family. They couldn't find a wife, they couldn't settle, couldn't you know, start a family in a home. And that was one of the reasons they all did rush off to war. Not so much they wanted to go to war, but it gave them money, status, clothing, and a reason for living. And this has just been made clear to me quite recently on Radio New Zealand, which fascinated me. So going back to my father, for 10 years from the age of 17, when Dad left the family farm in Tuakau after an argument with his domineering father, so until he was 27, he worked on high country sheep stations in the South Island, just he, his horse and his dogs. At 27, he'd saved enough money and decided to enrol in a two-year agricultural science diploma at Massey in Palmerston North. Conscription in New Zealand started in July 1940, when Dad was finishing off his diploma at Massey. So early 1941 found him, at 29 years old, doing temporary work in farms around Auckland, awaiting his call-up. He, he knew it would happen. So he came up to um, Auckland area, spend time with his family, do, do a bit of temporary work and just wait for the dreaded letter. Then he thought of a plan. Knowing he was extremely colourblind, he applied for the Air Force. Time went by, and finally they rejected him. Then he applied for the Navy, and they too rejected him. But by now it was 1942, and he had managed to evade the war, hoping it would end soon. Unfortunately, they got him. 1942... The army got him, 
and he was sent to the Melanesian Islands where he served for two years as the guy who, I think, I don't know the name of them, but they run up the hill with, with the radio and he sat at the top of the hill radioing back to the gunners what length they had to fire the guns, what angle. Spotter. Uh-huh, spotter. So that's what he did. My dad died of cancer in age 70, uh, but I was only 26. So I feel very robbed at the time I could have spent with him. I would have loved to have asked him so many more questions. By the time I got to 26, I was fascinated in what my parents' lives, but it was too late. I didn't have much time to get to know him as an adult and ask him all those questions that I would have liked to ask. But I did ask once if he believed in God and what he thought of religion. He told me that his family were believers who regularly attended church. But after his experience in the war, he was now an atheist. He said that during the war, there was a lot of downtime when there was no fighting. And his battalion, not sure what the correct name for a group of soldiers is, they used to help the local villagers on the islands. Apparently, they also played a lot of cards and cribbage while they had downtime. They sprayed DDT to combat malaria and did other things to help improve the lives of the locals. He said that after his, the time he spent with the local people, he just couldn't believe that they wouldn't be saved because in the eyes of the church they were pagans and wouldn't be saved. He found them to be good, honest, hard-working people who he viewed as equal. If his Melanesian friends couldn't be saved, he was no longer a Christian. So he instantly became an atheist. Thank you so much for your contributions. In 2016, I stepped foot on the island of Crete to meet my distant cousin, who was born during World War I. When the fear of German occupation in World War II became a reality, her father dug a bomb shelter out of the rock face, lined with stone benches and cushions, under her massive home, Bella Vista. Later, it had to be vacated within 24 hours, and they were given a smaller house in Hanya's old town. In a desperate act, her mother gathered up armfuls of personal papers, British books, ledgers, charts and diaries, marched to the top of a wall above the sea and let go, the heavy books sinking to the bottom, the lighter papers floating on the waves. They never returned to Bella Vista. It was given to the UNRA after the occupation. Interestingly, the Germans never left their mark on the house. However, in the town of Hanya, between the tavernas full of holidaying Brits, is one war-bombed building. A scar is fresh today as the day that it crumbled. It wasn't rebuilt due to an ownership or a family drama. It stands imprinted in my mind as the scars of war that we live around right there, but often unnoticed. A scar so huge that it moves me more than visiting the war graves in Suda Bay or any Anzac dawn service. You may have noticed I'm wearing a white poppy for peace and we have many bouquets of them here. And there, to remember all the casualties of war and to promote peace, um, the church has bought them. All proceeds are going to the White Poppy Peace Scholarships. So do come up and take a card. Take one for yourself and take two for some friends. Clay will tell you that um, sacred cows make the best hamburgers. Does anyone here remember Nancy Fox? Oh, lots of people. Oh, that's nice. 
1960, Nancy wrote, cows are very useful animals. Sacred cows are not. Anzac Day is one of New Zealand's sacred cows, and each year it releases floods of new words. Remember, lest we forget. Far too many words are spoken, and far too little real remembering is done. She was for the honest facing of the fact that Gallipoli was a catastrophic failure and a great waste of young men. All the fudge on Anzac Day disguised this. Perhaps it was designed to disguise this. Today we are still sending troops to war, but not supporting them when they come home. Veterans are finding themselves victims of post-traumatic stress syndrome and often homeless. RSAs, supported by drinking, gambling and street collections, are closing throughout Australasia. How can we be so blind and forgetful? Today's postlude is a meditation for peace. If violence begins with stressful thoughts in the mind, then peace begins with silence in the mind. Join me in the closing postlude, relaxing into the repetitiveness of the music and of your breath. Close your eyes and meditate on the freedom we enjoy today. And may our next step be one towards peace. Blessed be.